Hello, I'm Amy Smith-Stewart, Senior Curator at the Aldridge Contemporary Art Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And I'm so pleased to be joined today by artist Harmony Hammond from her home in Galisteo, New Mexico. We're together today to speak about her 50-year survey, Material Witness, Five Decades of Art, which originated at the Aldridge and then traveled to the Sarasota Art Museum, where it just opened to the public. Before we dive in, a very brief introduction about Harmony and the exhibition. This long overdue survey examines a 50-year practice that spans painting, sculpture, and works on paper, as well as teaching, activism, curation, and writing. Harmony, Harmony has made her life's work at the hotly generative crossroads where feminism, minimalism, process art, and biographical experience intersect, while defiantly resisting all such classifying designations. It includes many works that are being presented together for the first time, others that have rarely been seen, and some haven't been shown for decades. Designed in close collaboration with Harmony, this survey focuses on a process-based methodology and politicized conceptual thinking that uses materials steeped in socioeconomic content to confront gender, sexual orientation, and class through an intersectional lens. As Harmony proclaims, all art participates in multiple narratives. It also brings together works from noteworthy series made in New York from 1971 to 1984, such as the presences, floor pieces, weave paintings, and the wrap sculptures, installational and mixed media paintings composed with vernacular materials recovered from the Arizona and New Mexico landscape from the 1980s through the 90s, and near monochromes, paintings initiated in the early 2000s and ongoing, along with several notable series of drawings. Hammond is not only a pioneering artist, she's also a trailblazing activist, author, and independent curator. She was the only artist to be a founding member of both AIR Gallery, the first all-women's cooperative art gallery in New York in 1972, and the Heresies Collective, which published the journal Heresies, a feminist publication on art and politics from 1977 to 1993. She also authored two books, Wrappings, Essays on Feminism, Art and the Martial Arts, from, which was published in 1984, and Lesbian Art in America, a Contemporary History, published in 2000, the first history of lesbian art in the United States from 1970 on, and still the principal text on the, on the topic to date. So let's begin with the title of the exhibition, Material Witness. Harmony, it points to the significance of your materials over the decades. Can you talk about the greater metaphorical implications of your choices and how they reflect your greater socio-political consciousness, which has been alive in, in your practice all along? Well, Amy, as you know, I was trained as a painter, but I, I work with many materials, I always have. Uh, it's my belief that materials and the ways that they're used contribute to content as much as form, sign, or symbol. So all materials, be they traditional or non-traditional, have histories and associations that travel with the materials into a work of art. Knowing this as an artist, then, I, I consciously select, juxtapose, and manipulate these materials to create meaning. It's what I call material engagement. You moved to downtown New York in 1969 from Minneapolis and became immediately a part of a burgeoning downtown art scene which was powered by protests against the Vietnam War, as well as marches for civil rights, gay rights, and women's rights. When you arrived in New York, you turned away from the reductive hard edge paintings that you were making in Minneapolis and started to work with fabric. How did this reflect your experiences as a young feminist artist working in downtown New York in 1970? Well, yes, as you said, it was a period of civil rights, in anti-American Vietnam War activism. It was the beginning of gay liberation, the second wave feminist movement, and the birth of the feminist art movement of which I was part. It was also a period of post-minimal interdisciplinary experimentation with materials and process resulting in work both conceptual and abstract. 
artists move back and forth between what might be called painting, sculpture, video, dance, performance, calling it one thing one day and another thing the next day. Feminists brought a gendered content to this way of working. But let me backtrack a bit. The summers of 1967 and 69, I traveled, uh, mostly hitchhiking, as I was a student in those days, across Europe and North Africa. I became aware, on that trip, I became aware of the creative work of non-Western cultures through collections of primitive art that I saw in European museums and galleries, as well as weavings that I saw in the souks or marketplaces of Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. When I moved to Minneapolis, uh, uh, from Minneapolis rather, to New York that fall after getting back from traveling, I, he I, I headed right away to the old Museum of American Indian up on the Upper West Side where I spent hours and hours every week looking at their fabulous collections. At the time, it was my favorite museum in all of New York. I also, at that time, discovered the Strand Bookstore on the Lower East Side. And the, low, the Strand Books, uh, Bookstore, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, had just like, I think miles of used and remaindered books. So I would uh, browse in the bookstore for hours, looking at books on textiles, tiles, architecture, and decorative arts of different countries and cultures. And at that time, now in New York, I began making paintings of the repetitive pattern motifs I found in the textiles. But then in 1970, my work changed radically. Armed with our new analysis of patriarchal power, I and other feminist artists abandoned the male-dominated site of painting, consciously choosing to work with materials, techniques, and formal strategies associated with women's traditional arts precisely because of their marginalized histories and associations. Then at a certain point, then I, I stopped painting the patterns I had found in the woven textiles and I began to use the cloth itself. My earliest feminist work incorporated fabric from worn out clothing and linens that were given to me by women friends, thereby literally putting my life in my art. I would rip up the fabric into rags, strips, dip them in acrylic paint, and attach them to larger pieces of cloth or each other, gradually building three-dimensional forms, intentionally problematizing both art and craft hierarchies, and distinctions between painting and sculpture. This work that I was now making was all about layering, connecting, and building whole forms out of fragments of materials at hand. Here's a good example here. Um, in the exhibition, there's two historic sculptural installations, um, the presences, which we see here, and the floor pieces. The presences were uh, made in 1971 and 1972, and as you can see, are a series of seven, although um, there's six here um, in the exhibition. They're freestanding, and they range from life size to slightly bigger. Um, they resemble ceremonial robes or powerful abstract bodies. Tattered and sometimes patterned rags are hanging down from wooden hangers that are dangling from ropes from the ceiling and their bottom edges are subtly grazing the floor, floor, which is extremely important to the installation. You have insinuated, um, you have called these a ragtag army of women claiming space. Can you talk a little bit about the en enduring importance of this body of work and also what it was like um, to be able to see the installation come together 46 years after it was originally presented? Yeah, well, I think you can see um, from this installation uh, a photograph of the presences that were brought together for the Material Witness Exhibition. Um, you can see what I've been describing and what you just described as um, how the presences were constructed out of these acrylic rags that were uh, given to me by women friends. And, and the pieces were, I want to say that the pieces were 
as I joined the different uh, 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 acrylic soaked pieces and strips of fabric or rags, that the pieces were literally built from the inside out, which I thought, and that was important to me because I felt it mirrored the women's liberation phrase that we heard a lot at the time, the personal is political, starting with the personal, with the center, and then moving out into the social political uh, realm. So, you know, I named these, I consciously named these presences at the time. To me, presence speaks of its opposite, absence. Therefore, presence is absence made visible. So that's what these pieces were about at the time. Women taking an occupying space, empowerment. And it was so great, I have to say, in, for that reason, um, in the context of the of, of, of recent Me Too, the recent Me Too movement, it was really great to see these uh, this kind of army or cadre of female presences collectively gathered uh, together in the Material Witness exhibition. And uh, unfortunately, I think they still play the same role today that they did back in the early 70s when they were made. Well, they certainly have such an incredible power when you walk through them. And the way that you installed them, um, they really are, they really confront the viewer from all sides, which I think is quite a powerful statement, especially one that we need right now. Well, what I can say another thing is the viewer was meant to walk in among them. So the viewer becomes part of that, that group of women. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Just beautiful. And, um, also, another um, historic sculptural installation a year later, um, and a, a body of work that actually you've called your most radical works, uh, referencing women's traditional arts. Um, it is a series of seven floor paintings. We see five here. Um, they were made in 1973 and were also composed out of colorful and sometimes pattern, but commercial um, knit fabric waste that you found on the streets. Um, near your Bowery studio, Soho being once um, a garment district. And again, here was an opportunity for the first time um, to show the floor pieces as you had originally intended, which were directly on the floor, not on plinths or low risers, um, and absent of any work on the walls. Can you talk a little bit about why this work is so still so radical for you and, and what you're thinking about in your practice and also um, address a little bit, um, talk about your intentionality in the installation parameters um, because it was just an incredible installation, so powerful. And I should also say at the Aldridge, we had this great opportunity to also be able to view them from above, from a gallery that looked down upon the floor pieces. Yeah, well, like you, like you just said, um, I began um, uh, working with the end, end cuts of bolts of knit fabric in the, that I would get out on the, find out, discarded out on the street in the garment districts of lower Manhattan. Um, and, I, and, and so I would go out and I would gather, they were really, really rolls of colorful, and as you said, sometimes patterned knit fabrics. They were in rolls of strips, maybe about this wide. They varied in width. And I would take these strips and braid it according to traditional braided rug techniques, and then stitch the braids uh, into a coil onto a, a, another, a, a fabric backing, and then I would partially paint the surfaces. By doing that, the braided rug literally and metaphorically became the support for the painting. Now, these floor pieces, which reference rag rugs, but are not functional as such, are about an inch high 
and about five, uh, they're very varying in, 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 in diameter, but let's say about five and a half feet in diameter. And they were intended to be placed directly on the floor, as you see here, and shown as a group with nothing on the walls at all. Their floor um, encouraging the viewer to look at what was on the floor, or and it was about them being grounded for sure. So by taking these pieces that occupy a, a space, again, between painting and sculpture, I thought of them more as paintings off the wall because I approached them as a painter. Um, by placing them down on the floor, I felt that it called into question um, assumptions about literally the place of painting. Uh, it's what we might call today, but I was doing it back then, we might call it um, expanded painting. A and it was. Um, I've always felt that they were my most radical pieces uh, at the time because, I think it was because, um, and, uh, because they're so close to the sources that they reference. Mm. I mean, a lot of feminist artists were making paintings or sculptures that referenced quilts, textiles, women's traditional needle arts in different ways. But these pieces, when you look at them, still look like braided rugs. And indeed, they are braided according to traditional braided rug techniques. It's only when you get up close that you can see that they are partially painted. Mm -hmm. and a little bit thicker in scale than a normal, quote, normal uh, braided rug would be. And, and so actually, at the time they were exhibited, a lot of people, including some feminist artists and, and critics, had difficulty with them because they were so close to the traditional needle arts versus taking the needle arts and putting it in the painting rectangle. Um, another really significant body of work that came in response uh, to the floor pieces are the weave paintings, which were from 1974 to 1977. And these were, uh, these are installed in both venues very in close uh, contact with each other, in conversation with each other. And the, these are return to painting um, and on the wall and have very uniquely raised surfaces, um, which almost look woven out of paint. And you have said this was a way also to insert gendered content into the field. And I was wondering if you could comment on that and also talk about um, you know, what it was like to go from working on the floor to working on the wall and why you made that choice. Well, um, we need to say that some of these, quote, bodies of work, like floor, the floor pieces, the weave paintings, it isn't like you stop one body of work one day and then necessarily begin a body of work the next day. They tend to overlap a little bit, at least in my studio. Um, and, and I always like that because work always leads to other work. So the floor pieces actually got me thinking about painting again. Um, just as I had moved from painting textile patterns to working on cloth and the needle arts, referencing cloth and the needle arts in my work, now, I, as you mentioned, I now very consciously brought women's traditional arts back into the painting field, but I was doing it on my terms. By layering the paint, which was mixed with Dorland's wax, which is a cold wax, um, and, and, and there were many layers of this paint and wax mixtures that were built up. And then, um, like you described, I obsessively, uh, 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 incised weave patterns that are found in textiles and basketry into the surface of the paintings. And by doing that, I revealed the colors that were underneath. And the result was a surface that looked less, it didn't look like it was um, 
describing or painting or illustrating weave patterns, but rather that the painting itself, the surface of the painting was literally woven out of paint. Um, I felt as I was doing this um, on my terms that I was literally taking the feminist project of creating a historical narrative of women's creativity, which is something we were all very involved with at the time, but I took it back into the painting field, merging traditional and fine arts literally in the skin of paint. Harmony, can you talk a little bit when you originally exhibited these, you also showed um, a case that had some of uh, fragments of clay that had the woven patterns in it. And just talk a little bit about why it was important to you to create this kind of museological presentation, connecting it back to um, women's craft, tr women's uh, craft traditions and also indigenous craft traditions. Yeah, I thought of the vitrine of these objects, which included baskets and sandals that I wove according to traditional uh, techniques. Again, we're like a we're in conversation with the paintings, so the, you know they were almost like uh, uh, providing footnotes to what I just said. So they were a reference to those traditional weaving techniques, and I should say, in addition to the woven baskets and sandals there were clay imprints of those woven items. Um, in a sense, I because uh, women made the first basketry and pottery, and pottery was basically discovered as baskets were smeared over with clay, and then when they were discarded in a fire, the clay pot uh, mm -hmm. remained. So in a funny way, I was referencing that um, process that discovery and that setting up a conversation between painting and the women's traditional arts and then hopefully bringing that conversation literally into the skin of paint uh, on what i call literally the painting body so around this time i begin thinking about paintings the objects of painting as painting bodies um, and of course i am a painting body as well so all of this starts kind of literally weaving together <laughs> um, talking about the painting body so um the rap sculptures um which you begun in 1977 um, through 1984 were made by wrapping rags and other fabric materials around mostly uh, found armatures. Um, then you coated the armatures with gesso or paint or latex rubber. Can you talk about how these works um, progressed in scale from what you described, hold the body to stand-ins for the female body and the way that this um, sculpture, this body of work kind of progressed over time? Um, to being on the wall, off the wall, leaning against the wall, from works that were more intimately scaled to very large works? Yeah, um, the, it, the rap sculptures really started because one day I simply grabbed some cloth and wrapped it around a lozenge shaped stretcher bar, um, a, a stretcher bar, the shape that you just saw in that painting the black leaf. So I had an empty stretcher bar and I wrapped the fabric around it using the stretcher bar as an armature for a three-dimensional form. And then, and then I painted the surface of the fabric with acrylic paint. The form that resulted uh, uh, resembled female genitalia. So I began, I was interested in that, and I began um, wrapping other found armatures, creating forms that at first, at first creating forms that suggested rafts, cradles, or cradle boards, which in turn protected or suggested bodies. I especially uh, liked using old broken and mended wooden ladders 
because ladders have a history of human bodies and labor attached to them. And um, again, I have to say, as with the presences, as I would literally take any kind of fabric I was using at this point and wrapping it around the found armature, which was usually wood, but sometimes metal, uh, the pieces again, like the presences were made from the inside out. These are not stuffed forms. And that was very important to me, that they were made from the inside out. So, and in this piece, Kong, the thing, giant finger-like uh, shape, hand shape or finger-like shapes were actually underneath the armature is Bentwood World War I dog sled parts that I found at some flea market. And they were beautiful, uh, and I just liked the shape, and they were used in a number of sculptures, including a piece called Sneak, and here they were used in this piece called uh, Kong. So what I like, the way I was using the armatures, let's think of a wooden armature like a ladder inside. Um, it, the ladder functioned as a skeleton, the wrapped layers of fabric as muscle and tissue, and then the acrylic paint on the surface literally was a skin. Mm. So the, the surface was nearly always painted one color. They were primarily monochrome um, with the actual wrapping process activating the surface, um, which was lumpy and bumpy. And I thought that a, a hard and soft, basically like women's bodies. Um, sometimes they were decorated uh, but basically, I began to use them, especially the ladder form, wrap ladder forms as stand in for female bodies. And I would often arrange them like the piece uh, Hug uh, or, or the piece Hunker Time. I would often arrange them in groups of two or more, um, speaking to the, uh, relationships and collectivity among women. Okay, so we'll jump ahead um, because the geography is important when thinking about the materials that you've utilized over the years, which is what this exhibition uh, really focused on. Um, in 1984, you left New York and you set out for New Mexico. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the work that you made once you were there from the mid-1980s, let's say through the 90s, um, these in large scale installational and mixed media paintings and environments that you created, how did they reflect um, your relationship to this new landscape, um, which was extremely different than the verticality of New York um, and the dense popu population of New York? Well, there definitely was a material shift. Um, just as I was gathering fabric on the streets in the garment districts of New York when I uh, moved to northern New Mexico. Um, my environment was very different. Um, and I began to work with materials. Well, gradually, it didn't happen immediately, but I began to work with materials and objects that I found on uh, abandoned farms as I drove um, through the rural landscape between New Mexico, where I live and lived then, and Arizona, where I uh, was teaching at the University of Arizona. And, and also, um, these materials, I began to find them. So, so I found them on the drives between New Mexico and Arizona, which I was doing on these drives frequently. But I also began to see them and find them in, um, in the border of Barrio Viejo, Mm -hmm. where I lived in Tucson while I was teaching. So like artists who always notice beautiful materials left around um, and also like using, like I said, the found, uh, using found materials and repurposing them because of their histories and associations, but also just their visual qualities. So I began to use rusted roofing tin, which you see here as kind of 
curtains or a, a, a valence around a old quilt that has also been partially painted. So I began to use uh, uh, this rusted roofing tin a lot, um, along with materials such as weathered linoleum, gutters, water troughs, buckets, rakes, wash tubs, uh, and, and even aprons and domestic, uh, more domestic things like aprons and washboards. I began to use these along with natural materials found in the Southwest, such as straw, roots, and leaves. And I began to use these materials in combination with pigment and with latex rubber, creating what I call large mixed media installational paintings that suggest abstract narratives of people and place. And I define place as a peopled space, or at one point it was a peopled space that may not be the people there now, like the abandoned farms. There's no one there, but the materials are there and the materials suggest narratives of what happened what, why is there no one there? Mm -hmm. And that's what I was really interested be in because I thought of the materials as bearing witness to lives and events that went on at a particular site. So this, many of the paintings actually um, sat on the floor, leaned against the wall with objects placed on their surfaces or in front of the painting surface um, as kind of tableau about violence, both natural and man-made or human-made um, and loss. This particular piece, Chicken Lady, uh, like I said, has a quilt, a stretched quilt in the middle, and then the panels of rusted roofing tin around three of the sides. The text is a story about a chicken lady that lived in Connecticut along the ocean. And uh, it's kind of a long story here, so I don't know if we want to go into it, but to simply say that um, there was a chicken lady who was a real outsider person. And this is her story as it was written to me by a young artist. And I put that letter tell, ask, telling me the story of chicken lady on these uh, metal panels. It's an example of when I use text. I, I occasionally do use text, but I usually use it when, again, there's a story to be told. And that's true here in the case of Chicken Lady. Okay, moving a little further. In the 2000s, there was yet again an, another shift. Once um, the objects and the found materials started to disappear and were that now replaced again with this animated this very thick uh, layers of paint you refer to these paintings as your near monochromes and many of them incorporate strips of repurposed canvas from the tatimi mats from your aikido studio a martial art you practiced for 36 years and i realized we forgot to mention that because it also played a part in the work in the floor pieces. But can you just talk about how the near monochromes connect back uh, to the bags and presences? I think that what we try to achieve with this exhibition is really showing the through line. Also just talk about um, how your technique and your practice and your and your ideas about these uh, about materials shifted into the near monochromes. Well, I don't, you know, when I'm working, I don't consciously think about how what I'm doing now related to my earlier work. <laughs> Sometimes I can see that. Um, when, that's, it's really one of the wonderful things about an exhibition, about a survey exhibition like this, is that I get to see that work in conversation, the work I'm doing now with work I was doing in the 70s. Um, I do think, I do think, Obviously, that materials play an important role. They always have. But how I use them, I think, is also somewhat consistent in the sense of it's very much about building a whole out of pieces or fragments, which I think of women's lives in that way. Um, but it's a lot about layering. It's an additive process. So whether it's on the wall or it sits out in space, 
as something we might call sculpture, it's nearly always an additive process for me. So I think that's one thread. Um, what did begin to happen after I was doing these very large tableau, these installational uh, paintings, is that I began to use fewer and fewer materials, uh, be more selective about the materials. And so what happened is that the pieces um, became less narrative. Mm -hmm. um, that said, however, the, the materials I did use uh, such as the recycled canvas um, mat covers from Aikido um, or grommeted straps or just even the metal grommets themselves as well as string and rope all and, and pieces of um, patches of, of uh, cotton or frayed burlap. These materials that I was now using um, didn't bring so much of a narrative sense with them but they were very important and they did bring uh, meaning into the work. Um, the straps, as you can see here in the red painting and the white painting, um, were now wrapped around the painting body, um, suggesting possibilities of binding, bondage, or restraint, uh, suggesting bodies that were negotiating uh, for freedom. But also at the same time, um, because I think that um, they also uh, suggest possibilities. If you look at the, what's happening with these uh, grommeted straps, if you look at the possibilities, it's, they're there uh, for connecting, uh, for bandaging, or even we can think of the wrapping of the, can the painting body as an embrace. Um, the paint in these paintings was thickly applied, uh, appearing, as you can see, um, monochromatic at a distance or at first glance. But when you got up close and really kind of, you know, stuck your face in the surface, underlaying colors were visible through cracks and crevices and certainly through the grommeted uh, holes. So you could kind of go from there to the painting that we're seeing here in the middle, which is from a series um, called Bandaged Grids. And the Bandaged Grids series and the Chenille series, of which we also have a painting in Material Witness, um, come out of the near monochrome paintings. Um, both include gridded fields of grommets, Grommets, metal grommets are, have a function in the world. They're meant to protect holes from tearing and ripping. Um, and here, used in a more pictorial way, they open up the pictorial space or the pictorial surface of the painting, alluding to spaces below or underneath the painting surface. And at the same time, they suggest body orifices. In the bandaged grids, like the painting in the middle here, uh, strips of canvas function as bandages where the paint oozes out of the grommeted holes. Every bandage implies a wound, and therefore a bandaged grid implies an interruption of the narrative of the modernist grid, and therefore an interruption of the presumed egalitarian order of the grid. And at the same time, it suggests a possibility of bandaging or holding together. And I think a possibility of healing. Um, mm -hmm. In the Chenille paintings, I don't think we have one here in this PowerPoint, but in the Chenille paintings, um, pieces of coarse burlap and grommets are embedded in the thick off-white uh, oil paint. And patterns created by the raised grommets suggest the cozy, soft texture and domestic warmth of tufted chenille bedspreads. However, reds and browns and golds assert themselves from underneath the surface of whiteness bleeding, blending, discoloring, and staining, giving agency to that which has been muffled, buried, or covered over. 
So I thought it was an opportunity. This is not a work in our exhibition, but I know that you've been hard at work um, working on a new body of work for your upcoming solo exhibition at Alexander Gray uh, in New York, which opens next month. Harmony, still on track? Yep. Yeah. I am still working here. Um, so the, the bandage quilt and cross paintings that will be on exhibition at Alexander Gray grow out of the formal strategies and conceptual concerns of the bandage grid and chenille paintings that I just described. Like I said, for me, work grows out of work. I don't do sketches in advance, but one painting leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And I, I think I need to say that while these paintings certainly resonate today in this time of social change, I actually started them back in the summer of 2019. Now, both series, the um, bandaged quilts and the cross paintings of which you see one here, um, continue my use of, of materials as a metaphor for the body and bodies. Uh, in the bandaged quilts, a basic quilt pattern is articulated in bandage-like strips of burlap and canvas. And here, as you can see, see in um, this is one of two very large cross paintings in the exhibition uh, rough burlap which comes from um, coffee sacks uh, are superimposed like giant bandages over a gridded field of grommets once again suggesting the, the, the tufted chenille coverlets it's like a giant plus sign a stand-in for the figure, a cross, crossing, intersectionality, and healing. Beautiful. So Amy, I think that's all I want to say for now, um, except that I'm very excited about uh, this exhibition of new work. Um, these are all uh, new paintings just out of the studio, and I hope people get to see it. The show is um, uh, opens November 12th, and I believe is up through January 16th. Oh, well, I'm really excited to see it. I know I'll be there. Um, thanks so much, Harmony, for your time today. I really appreciate it, and um, hopefully maybe I'll see you in New York. I'll definitely see your work. Thank you, Harmony. I, I hope I do see you in New York, Amy. And anyway, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you for working with me and curating this exhibition. It's been great. It was such an honor and a privilege. Thank you, Harmony.